Hello guys, welcome to the listeners part and you are watching This is going to hurt chapter 1. Please subscribe to my channel and click the like button if you like this video. And let's get started. Chapter 1. House Officer The decision to work in medicine is basically a version of the email you get in early October asking you to choose so many options for the work Christmas party. No doubt, you will choose a chicken to be on the safe side. And it's more than likely everything will be alright. But what if someone shares a ghastly factory forming video on the Facebook before the day before and you inadvertently witness a nasty baking? What if Morrissey dies on November and in out of respect for me, you turn back on a lifestyle that's far devoted almost exclusively to consuming meat? What if you develop a light threatening allergy to escalopes? Ultimately, no one knows what they will fancy for dinner and 60 dinner time. Every doctor makes their career choice aged 16. Two years before, they are legally allowed to text a photo of their own genitals. When you sit down and pick your A-levels, you are set off on a trajectory that continues until you either retire or die. And unlike your World Christmas party, Janet from Procurement once swap your chicken for a Helluni skewers, you were stuck with it. At 16, you reason for wanting to pursue a career in medicine or generally along the lines of my mom's dad's doctor. I could like Holby said it. Or I want to cure cancer. Reasons 1, 2 are ludicrous and reason 3 would be perfectly fine if a little earnest. Were it not for the fact that what research scientists do, not doctors. Besides, holding anyone to the word at that age seems a bit unfair on a pair with declaring that I want to be an astronaut, painting you did age 5 a legally binding document. Personally, I don't remember medicine never being an active career decision, more just a deferred setting for my life. The murmuring tone, the stroke of a photo mountain range as your computer background. I grew up in a Jewish family, they were mostly in it for food. Went to the kind of Dutzas Cecilia sausage factory, designed to churn out medicals, lobster and cabin members and my dad was a doctor. It was written on the walls. Because medical schools are oversubscribed tenfold, all the candidates must be interviewed with only those who perform best under, under a grilling being awarded a place. It's assumed all applicants are on course for straight as it are labeling. So universities base their decisions on non-academic criteria. This of course makes sense. A doctor must be psychologically fit for the job, able to make decisions under a terrifying amount of pressure, able to break bad news to anxious relatives, able to deal with death on a daily basis. They must have something that cannot be memorized or graded. A great doctor must have a huge heart and a distended iota through which pumps a vast lack of compassion and human kindness. At least, that's what you think. In reality, medical schools don't give the shiniest shit about any of that. They don't even check you're okay with the sight of blood. Instead, they fix it on extracurricular activities. The ideal student is captain of two sports team, the country swimming is champion, leader of the youth orchestra and editor of the school newspaper. It's basically a bisque and geniality contest without the sash. Look at the Wikipedia entry for any famous doctor and you will see. He proved himself an accomplished rugby player in youth leagues. He excelled as a distance runner and in his final year at school was vice captain of the athletics team. This particular description is of a certain Dr. H. Chimpuan, so it's perhaps not a rock solid system. Imperial College in London was satisfied that my distinction in grade 8 piano and saxophone alongside some half hour set theatre previews for the school magazine qualified me perfectly for life on the words and so in 1998 I packed my bags and embarked upon the treacherous six-mile journey from Dalwich to South Kensington. As you might imagine, learning every single aspect of the human body's anatomy and physiology, plus each possible way it can malfunction, is a fairly gargantuan undertaking. But the buzz of knowing I was going to become a doctor one day, such a deal you get to literally change your name, like a superhero or an international criminal, propelled me towards my goal throughout six long years. Then there I was, a junior doctor. I could have won mastermind with a specialist subject, the human body. Everyone at home would be yelling at their TVs that the subject I had chosen was too vast and wide-ranging that I should have gone for something 
like Atiro's Kaloruses or Boyanians that they would have been wrong. I would have nailed it. It was finally time to step out onto the ward armed with all his exhaustive knowledge and turn theory into practice. Masprim couldn't have been called any tighter, so it came as a quiet blow to discover that I would spend a quarter of my life in medical school. I had it remotely prepared me for the jackal and high day sections of a house officer. During the day, the job was manageable, if mind-numbling and insanely time-consuming. You turn up every morning for the world around, where your whole team of doctors pour towards the path of each of their patients. You trail behind like a hypnotized duckling, your head cooked to one side in a caring manner, noting down every pronouncement from your seniors, book an MRI refer to a rheumatology range and ECG. Then you spend the rest of your working day, plus generally a further unpaid for house. Completing this dozen sometimes hundreds of tasks, filling in forms, making phone calls. Essentially, you are a glorified PA. Not really what to train so hard for, but whatever. The night shifts, on the other hand, made Dante prickle, look like Disney, an unrenting nightmare that made me regret ever thinking my education was being unrealized. At night, the house officer is given a little paging device affection called a bleep, a responsibility for every patient in the hospital. The fucking lot of them. The night show and rest and register will be down in A and E reviewing and admitting patients while you run up on the reports. Sailing the ship alone, the ship that's enormous and on fire that no one has really thought how to how to sail. You've been trained how to examine a patient cardiovascular system. You know the physiology of the coronary vasculature, but even when you recognize every sign and system of a heart attack, it's very different to actually managing one for the first time. Your people by ward after ward, nurse after nurse, with emergency after emergency, it never stops, all night long. Your senior colleagues are seeing patients in A and E with a specific problem like pneumonia or a broken leg. Your patients are having similar emergencies, but they are hospital patients, meaning they already had something significantly wrong with them in the first place. It is a build your own burger of symptoms laid on conditions laid on diseases. You see a patient with pneumonia who was submitted with liver failure or a patient who has broken their leg falling out of bed after another epileptic fit. Your one-man mobile, essentially untrained A and E department, getting drenched in bodily fluids, not even the fun kind, reviewing an endless stream of worryingly sick patients, 12 hours earlier had an entire team of doctors caring for them. You suddenly long for the 16-hour admin sessions or ideally some kind of compromised job that's neither massively beyond nor beyond your abilities. It's a sink or swim and you have to learn how to swim because otherwise in a ton of patients of sink with you, I actually found it all perversely exhilarating. Sure and it's were hard, sure the house were bordering on inhumans and sure I saw things that have scared my retinas to this day. But I was a doctor now. Tuesday. 3rd of August 2004 Day 1 H has made me a packet lunch I have now used that scope, a new shirt and a newly mailed address adam.k at the nhs.net It's good to know that no matter what happens today nobody could accuse me because of a more being of the most incompetent person in the hospital and even if I'm I can blame it on Adam and enjoying the ice breaking potential of the story but at the pub afterwards, my anecdote is rather trumped by my friend Amanda. Amanda's surname is Sanders West, the Wednesday, 18th of August 2004. Patient OM, a 70 year retired heating engineer from Stock on Trend, but tonight Matthew is going to be an eccentric German professor with Z and Quinsing agent. Not just tonight, in fact, but this morning. This afternoon and every of Davis admission, thanks to his dementia, exacerbated by a urinary tract infection. Professor Orms, who favorite routine is to follow behind the wardroom, his hospital ground and back to front like the white coat, plus or minus underwear for a bit of morning breaks first, and chip in with yes, that is correct, and the occasional genius whenever doctor says something. On consultant and register wards, I escort him back to his bed immediately and make sure the nursing staff keep him tucked in for a couple of hours. On my solo rounds, I let him tag along for a bit. 
I don't particularly know what I'm doing and I don't have vast depths of confidence even when I do. So it's actually quite helpful to have a supernaturated German man cheerleader behind me shouting out, that is brilliant, every so often. Today he took a dump on the floor next to me, so I sadly have to retire him from active duty. Monday 30th of August 2004 Whatever we lack in free time, we more than make up for in stories about patients. Today the mess, over lunch we are trading stories about nonsense and st- symptoms that patients with presented with. Between us in the last few weeks, we have seen patients with itchy teeth, suddenly improvement in hearing and all in pain duration to urination. Each one gets a polite ripple of laughter like a local dignitary speech at a graduation ceremony. We go round the table sharing our version of campfire ghost stories until it's a seesaw stone. He tells us he saw someone in A&E this morning who thought they were only sweating from half of their face. He sits back in anticipation of bringing the house down, but there's merely silence until pretty much time everyone chimes in with so Horner's syndrome then. He's never heard of it, specifically not the fact that it likely indicates a lung tumor. Seema scrapes his chair back with, with an ear-splitting switch and dashes off to make a phone call to get the patient back to the department. I finished books. Friday 10th of September 2004 I noticed that every patient on the ward has a pulse of 60 recorded in their observation chart so I surreptitiously inspect the healthcare assistant's measurement technique. He feels the patient pulse, he looks at his watch and meticulously counts the number of seconds per minute. Sunday 17th of October 2004 to give myself no credit, I watched over, I didn't know what else to do. I asked the nearest nurse to Hugo. I asked the nearest nurse to get Hugo, my registrar, who was in the next ward. In the meantime, I put on a van flown. And I ran some fluids. Hugo arrived before I could do anything else, which was handy, and I swore completely out of ideas by that point. Start looking for the patient's topcock, shove loads of kitchen roll down his throat, Float some basil in it and declare it gas structure. Hugo diagnosed esophageal varices, which made sense as, as the patient was the color of Homer Simpson from the early series, where the contrast was much more extreme and everyone looked like a cave painting, and, and he tried to control the bleeding with a sangston tube. As the patient fled alone, resisting this awful thing, Going round to this door, the blood jetted everywhere on me, on Hugo, on the walls, curtains, ceiling. It was particularly a one guard episode of changing rooms. The sound was the worst part. With every breath the poor man took, you could hear the blood sucking down into his lungs, choking him. By the time the tube was inserted, he would stop bleeding. Bleeding always stops eventually, and this was the saddest reason. Hugo pronounced the patient's death wrote up notes and asked the nurse to inform the family. I peeled off my blood, chocolate clothes and we silently changed it into scrubs for the rest of the shift. So there we go. The first death that we ever witnessed it never been as horrific as it could possibly have been. Nothing romantic or beautiful about it. That sound. Hugo took me outside for a cigarette. We were desperately needed after that. And I had never spoken before. Tuesday 9th November 2004 Bleeped awake at 3 am from my must half hour short year and 3 of shifts to press Kai by sleeping full for a patient whose sleep is evidently much more important than mine. My powers are greater than I realized. I arrive on the robot to find the patient is asleep. Friday 12th of November 2004 An impatient's blood results for her clotting is all over the shop for no good reason. Hugo eventually cracks it. She has been taking St. John's wood capsules for a health food. Hugo points out to her that it had me with the metabolism of four forfarin and her clotting will probably settle down if you stop taking it. She is astonished. I thought it was just a herbal. How can it be that bad for you? At the sound of the words just herbal, the temperature in the room seems to drop a few degrees and Hugo barely holds in a weary sigh. It's clearly not his first time at this particular rodeo. 
apricot stones contain cyanide he replies dryly the death cap mushroom has a 50% fatality rate naturally does not equal safe there's a plant in my garden where if you simply sat under it for 10 minutes then you'd be dead jog down she bends the tablets ask him about the plant over a colonoscope copy later what a lily Monday 6th of December 2004 Old Junior's daughter at the hospital have been asked to sign a document opting out of the European Working Time Directive because our contracts are not compliant with it This week I've seen H402 house and work for a grand total of 97 Non compliant doesn't quite seem to cover it My contract has taken the directive dragged it screaming from its bed in the deaf night and waterboarded it Thursday 20 January 2005 Dear Jack Greening Scott Over the last few nights we have to admit three young men and women called Ray as a husk basically collapsed through hypertension and with their electrolytes up the fuck The only connection between these individuals is recent use of cocaine for all its hot attacking symptoms shrinking risks cocaine does not cause this to happen to people What am I pretty confident is going on there and I won Nobel prize or at the very least a pride of written award if I'm right is that you have been bulking out of supply with your nans nans diuretics aside from back you were wasting my evenings and my units beds it feels like fairly terrible business practice to be hospitalizing your customers kindly use chalk like everyone else with faithfully Dr Adam K Monday 31st January 2005 I saved a life tonight. I was believed to say 68 old the patient who was a close to death's door as it's possible to be. You told the press at the bell and was peering through the frosted glass into the grim repairs hallway. His oxygen saturation was 73%. I suspect if the vending machine had been out of order and I bought my sneakers as a plan. You do that have been too late to I didn't even have the spare seconds to run through the bullet points of a management plan in my head. I just started performing action after action or in autopilot mode. I didn't know the eyes of process. Oxygen on intravenous access, blood test, blood gases, diuretic catheter. He started back up pretty much immediately. The bunkie dropped jacking in him back from million admittance about the concrete. Sorry that you one shot from dinner party this evening. By the time Hugo arrived, I felt like Superman. A strange realization that it's the first time I've actually saved a life in 5 months as a doctor. Everyone on the outside imagining we drove the words performing routine acts of heroism. I even assumed that myself when I started. The truth is all the dozens maybe hundreds of lives are saved every day on hospital wards almost every time it happens it's in a much more lucky team based way. Not by a bunch of performing a single action so much as implementing a sensible plan which gets carried by out men of mer of Kerlix who at every stage check the patient is getting better modify the plan if they're not but sometimes it's down to one person and today for the first time it was me Hugo seems happy or at least as happy as he is capable of being well you could bought him another couple of films on earth come on give a superhero a break here Monday 7th of February 2005 My move to surgery has rewarded me with my very first decloving injury which is why the skin is traumatic huge ones are in Patient W is 18 and was out celebrating with friends After checking out time he found himself dancing on the floor of the fast shelter and they decided to descend to ground level using a handy neighboring lab post as a fireman's pole He jumped over to the lamp post and slid down koala bear style. He unfortunately fortunately misjudged the texture of the lamp post. It wasn't the smooth diet he was expecting at all, but a chafing agonizing gritty slump to the bottom. He therefore presented to ANE with severe grazing to both palms, completely gouging off his penis. I have seen a lot of penis in my brief time in urology, but This was far and away the worst than I have ever seen. What the other was it? I found it there been a place to pen it. A couple of inches of urethra coated with a thin layer of bloody pulp. 
maybe a half centimeter diameter in total. It brought to mind a remnant of spaghetti stuck to the bottom of a bowl by a smear of tomato sauce. Perhaps not surprisingly, Dublin was upset. His distress was only made worse when he asked if his penis could be re -gloved. Mr. Vince, the consultant, calmly explained that the glove was spread evenly up eight foot of lampposts in Blast London. Monday, 21st February 2005. Discharging a patient home for after laparoscopy, I sent her off work for two weeks. She offers me a tenner to sign her off for a month. I laugh, but she's serious. Observe for offer to 15 quid. I suggest that she sees a GP if she's not feeling up to work after a fortnight. I clearly need to desmort her if that's the level of bribe I'm attracting. On the way home, I wonder how much she would have needed to offer before I said yes. Depressingly, I put it somewhere around 50 euros. Sunday, 20 March 2005. There's more to breaking bad news than I'm afraid it's cancer and we did everything we could. Nothing can prepare you for sitting down a patient's daughter to explain that something rather upsetting happened to her after an elderly father overnight. I had to tell her that the patient in the bed next to her dad's become extremely agitated and confused last night. That he thought her father was in fact his own wife. That unfortunately by the time that the nurse heard the commotion and uttered it was too late. And this patient was threatened that father and had ejaculated onto his face. At least I didn't go any further than that, said the daughter in the world class demonstration, finding the positive in a situation. Monday 11, April 2005. About to take a 10 year old straight from A and E to theatre for ruptured appendix. Colin, a charming registrar, has to come in conducting a master class in dealing with worried mom. Explaining everything that's going on her son's tummy, what we're going to do to fix it, how long it will take, when you'll be allowed to home. I try to absorb his method. It's about telling her just the right amount, keeping her informed but not overwhelmed, and delivering everything at the right level. Not too much gargon, but never patronizing. Above all, it's up being professional and kind. Her explanation become less uneasy and by the second Emma can feel the angst leave her body like an evil spirit or trapper woman. It's time to take the kid upstairs. So Colin nods to the mom and says, quick kiss before he goes after bed theater. She leans over and pecks Colin on the cheek. Her pride and joy is spilled away, his worn cheek sadly dry. Tuesday 31st of May 2005. Three nights ago, I admitted patient MJ, a homeless guy in his 50s with acute pancreatitis. This was the third time we admitted him with acute pancreatitis since I started this job. We got him comfortable with pain relief and started him on IV fluids. He was sore and miserable. At least you get a warm bed for a few nights, I said. Are you joking? He replied. I'll get bloody MRSA in here. It's come to something when the streets count that a hospital have a better reputation for cleanliness than the corridors within. I don't like to preach, but I'm a doctor. Not wanted him to die is kind of the job description. So I reminded him he's not here because of alcohol. And even if I can't preach you to stop drinking, I can't, could at least ask him to stay off it until we have got him out of hospital as that will really help. This time, it will be really bonus if you wouldn't mind laying off the alcohol dispensers. He read back like, I just accused him of to incest, telling me that of course he would never do that. They've changed the recipe recently and now it tastes really bitter. He pulled me closer to whisper in my head that in this hospital you are best off sucking on some of the sanitizing wipes then gave me a conspiration attack on the Roman offensive say that's no one tonight he would just start himself home but will doubtless be back with us in the coming weeks. As per tradition, I celebrate the end of our run of night shifts with my SHO and go for a slap of breakfast and a bottle of white brand wind chat water. Night shifts are essentially a different time zone to the rest of the country, so even though it's nigh a name, you can hardly call it an eye opener. It's practically night crap. As I'm refilling our glasses, there's a knock on the window. It's MJ who laughs uproariously before shoot means best. I knew it. Look, 
look at the swap to it further from the window next time or to just have a quick sulk on the alcohol wipe in the changing rooms. Sunday 5th of June 2005 It would be unfair to label every single orthopedic surgeon as a bone crunching turtle simply on the basis of 99% of them made lifeless too but my heart does seem to sink with every night time bleep or till war war. So far this weekend I've reviewed two of their patients Yesterday, a man in atrial fibrillation, meaning the heart is beating too fast. Following surgery for a fractured neck of thing, I note from his note admission, he was in and his naved atrial fibrillation at that point too, in fact, completely non-noticed by his admitting team, even though it would honestly certainly explain why he ended with sprawled across the floor in Devonus. In the first place, I feel like running a teaching session for the orthopedic department entitled Sometimes people fall full over it for a reason. Today, I am asked to review a 20 year old patient whose blood tests show up normal renal function. Both his arms are in full blast to cars, like a Scooby Doo villain. He's got no drip or fluids and an untouched glass of water on his bedside table that, despite all the pain in the world, I'm sure physics has prevented him from touching for the past couple of days. I prescribe IV fluids for the patient, though it be more efficient to prescribe common sense for some of my colleagues. Tuesday 7th of June 2005 Assessing in theatres on the emergency list, removing a foreign subject from a patient's rectum. Less than years a doctor and this is the fourth object I've removed from a rectum, professionally at least. My first encounter was a handsome young Italian who attended hospital with the majority of a toilet brush inside of him, bristles first, and went home with a colostomy bag. His big Italian mother was grateful in his ways that Brits never are, lavishing thanks and praise on every member of staff she met for saving her son's life. She put her arm round the equally handsome young man who attended hospital with her son. And thank God for Sprint Philip for staying in the spare room at the time to call the ambulance. Most of these patients suffer from Eiffel syndrome. Eiffel, Dr. Eiffel. And the tales of how things get but can be sky scraper troll. Come to think of it, it's only a matter of time before someone tries to sit on the gracon. But today is the first time I've actually believed the patient's story. It's credible and painful sounding incident with the sofa and remote control that at the very least had me a furrowing brain and thinking, well I suppose it could happen. Upon removal of the remote control in the editor, we may notice a condom on it, so maybe it wasn't a complete accident. Thursday 16, 2005 I told the patient that his MRI wouldn't be until next week and he threatened to break both my legs. My first thought was when well, it will be a couple of weeks of work, I was this close to offering to find him a baseball bat. Saturday 25 June 2005 Called to pronounce death on an elderly patient. He'd been extremely sick, wasn't for resuscitation, and this wasn't un- unexpected. The staff nurse takes me to the cubicle, points out the slight grey former patient, and returns me to with a wife, who you could say isn't technically a widow, until I make the call he, that he's officially dead. Nature may do all the heavy lifting, but you still need me on hand to swim the form. I extend condolences to the patient's wife and suggest she might want to wait outside while I perform some formalities, but, but she said she would rather stay. I'm not sure why. I don't think she is either. Perhaps every moment with him matters, even if he's no longer with us. Or maybe she wants to check I'm not one of those doctors she's read about in the mail who does unspeakable things to be deceased. Anyway, she's settling down in her front row seat, whether I like it or not. I pronounced three deaths before, but this is the first time I've had a captive audience. I feel I should have laid on the refreshment. She clearly doesn't realize quite how tense, slime and drawn out this evening's performance is going to be, more better than Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. I confirm the patient's identity from his hospital wristband, check visually for respiratory effort, check there's no response to baseball or physically stimuli. 
Feel for a carotid pulse, check for with dots that people so fix and dilate or check the watch and listen with stethoscope for heart sounds for 2 minutes then listen for lung sounds for another 3 minutes. Overkill feels like an inappropriate word but 5 minutes is an extraordinary long time when you are standing motionless under brilliant wildlight. You stethoscope pressed against a definitely a dead man's chest, absorbed by his grieving wife. This is why we try and get them off to the room for this bit. I understand why we take the time to make sure it's kind of a deal breaker with death. The almost widow keeps asking me if I'm okay. I don't know whether she thinks I'm too upset to move or have just forgotten what to do next in the death pronouncing. But every time she says something, I leap like, well, like a doctor hearing a noise, listening carefully, listening to the test of the corpse. Once I peel the cells off the ceiling and compose myself, I confirm the sad news to her and document my findings. It was certainly agonizing five minutes, but if the whole medicine thing goes to itself, I'm only a tin of shill with dual and an old crate away from a gig in convent garden as a living statue. Tuesday, 5th of July 2005, trying to work out a 70 word lady, alcohol consumption to record in the notes. I have established that wine is her poison. How much wine do you drink per day? Would you say? Patient about 3 bottles on a good day. Okay, and on a bad day? On a bad day, I only manage one. Thursday, 7 July 2005. Terrorists are drug cities across London. Major incident declared. All doctors told to report to A and E. My responsibility was to ground the surgical wards and discharge any patient whose life or limb wasn't in immediate danger to clear the deaths for new arrivals from the bombings. I was like a snowplow with a stethoscope, booting out anyone who got to the third syllable of malingual without passing out or coughing a blood got rid of hundreds of the blood blocking fuckers. Wednesday 13 of July 2005 The hospital didn't receive any casualties and with no patients I basically done no work for a week. Saturday 23 July 2005 This weekend is my best made raw and stack do and I've been well to bail up with barely 4 hours notice. It's annoying for a million reasons from the fact that it was just a close selection of pals with only 8 of us making the cut to the personalized t-shirts to the uneven paint peeling teams to the fact I spent 400 fucking pounds on it. I was originally due to be working but arranged a 4 way swap so it was slightly precarious like a house purchase and a massive chain and now one of the four who hardly bet me for a trial or imagined childcare issues for one of the real or imaginary children. So I'm here on the ward instead of sobbing of my tits on tequila. Non medics struggle to understand. It doesn't actually help having loads of notice for this kind of more than two months' notice. We don't have the road yet. I order a bottle of whiskey, I can't afford. I can virtually hear a lot John saying, Steady on, let's not go crazy here and arranged to have not to deliver to Ron's plot and his return alongside my groveling apologist. We arranged a stack to post to tourist for to just two of us for a fortnight time. After my run of nights and after three locum splits, I broke it in covered to the course of weekend. I'm now missing. Friday 29 July 2005 I spent the entire night shift feeling like water is gushing into the hull of my boat and the only thing on hand to bail it was with a Sylvian family rapids contact lens. Everything I'm babel about it take at least 15 minutes to 5 flight. And I'm getting I'm getting cold about a new place every 5 minutes. So the sums don't quit add up. My SHO and register are tied up in a busy a &E. So I prioritize the sickest soundling patients and I manage the expectations of the nurses who call me about anything else. I'm really sorry but I've got lots of patients who are much more urgent. I say, realistically, it will be about 6 hours. Some understand and some react like I've just fuck off. I'm in the middle of an alley make bulb exit binge. I ran from chest end to sepsis to atrial fibrillation to acute asthma like like some of kind of medical decathlon and somehow everyone gets through it alive.
At 8 a.m., one of the night sisters leaves me to tell me I did really well tonight and she thinks I'm a good little doctor. I'm willing to overlook the fact that good little doctor sounds like an an Ian and Blackton character becomes pretty sure that it's the first time I've heard anything or brought such compliments since I qualified. I don't really know what to say, but stuttered my thanks. In my confusion, I accidentally sign off with Love you, bye. It's partly out of exhaustion, partly my brain misfiring because H is normally the only person who says nice things to me, and partly because in that moment, I genuinely loved her for saying that.